Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Gentile. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon Him. Zola Levitt presents Considering the times and seasons of our world today, here's Zola Levitt. Shalom. Hello again. Uh, we're continuing from last week, I think a very interesting and uh, uh, educational sort of program. On our last Israel tour, we had the opportunity to travel into Ramallah in the West Bank, which has turned out to be the de facto Palestinian capital, if you will. That's where Arafat's headquarters is. And that's where we encountered with a Palestinian a film crew who are very courteous and professional. Uh, they took us to Dr. Hanan Ashrawi, who is one of the Palestinian Authority spokespeople. She's uh, recently appeared in the United States University of Colorado, I believe. She has before been uh, a speaker here and taught at the University of Virginia. And uh, she uh, gave us her view of the whole controversy going on in Israel. And uh, I listened politely. I did not interrupt or argue or, uh, and, and much of what she said uh, is, is uh, uh, worth hearing and quite truthful. And other things are more controversial. And rather than being the spokesperson, uh, we turned this footage over to two Arab Christian experts that we know. Dr. Ishwawi is an Arab Christian and her peer, Dr. Ergen Kainer, an Arab Christian is a professor at Criswell College in Dallas. And then Joseph Farah, the editor of World Net Daily, a very knowledgeable uh, Arab American Christian. Uh, Dr. Kainer was raised as the son of a Musaean and uh, uh, as a Muslim and then converted to Christ. Uh, Joseph Farah uh, was raised in an Arab Christian family. They differ in that respect, but at this point they are her peers and they commented on what she said. So uh, now picking up where we left off last week, we'll hear from uh, Dr. Ashrawi and then our commentators. I read an article about you in an Anglican magazine describing your Christian testimony and so on. It was excellent. Uh, on the McNeil Lair report, you made a statement that was curious. Uh, you said Jesus Christ was a Palestinian prophet born in <laughs> Bethlehem in my country. Yes. I, I wondered about that. Uh, yeah. Well, of course, he was born Jewish, but he was a Palestinian because he was born in Palestine. There are still many Jewish Palestinians, of course. Um, but, the, I mean, those who chose to be Israeli are Israeli Jews, but there are many, mostly outside Israel, who are Palestinian Christians. There are some who are puristic. But, no, I felt that he belongs to my heritage, to my past, and we are the most ancient Christian community. And he was a Palestinian, he was a Jew, and he became a Christian. We have to deal with uh, the issue of Hanan Ishrawi's uh, Christian testimony a little bit. Um, number one, I think it's very important to understand, uh, particularly for American audiences, that when people in the Middle East talk about themselves as being Christian, uh, often they're, what they're talking about really is a form of cultural Christianity rather than a, a, a deep-seated uh, belief of the heart. Um, and I believe that's where uh, Hannah Nishrawi is coming from uh, in defining herself as a Christian Arab. She talks about uh, Jesus Christ being a Palestinian and uh, her rationale for that is that he was born in Palestine. Well, that's kind of ludicrous because uh, the, 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 the first time the, the term Palestine is used is in 70 AD when the Romans renamed Israel uh, Palestine as a, a way of adding insult to injury after they destroyed the temple and committed genocide against the Jews. So the idea that Jesus Christ was a Palestinian is a very uh, much of a stretch. What would happen, and this is almost a fantasy, but uh, let's say a, a two-nation solution is formed, something like it, but Palestinians have a nation control. And as a matter of fact, since they're largely Muslim, they begin to act like a Muslim government, tell you to put a, cover your hair, uh, this sort of thing? Historically, Palestine has always been one of the most tolerant, open, liberal and pluralistic societies in the Arab world and in the region. Tolerant. Open. I wonder how she would classify the Six-Day War. Was that tolerant and open? How about Yom Kippur? We hear in our culture today, especially in America in this winter, that we should not bomb during Ramadan, 
that, that, that we should not bomb during Eid al-Fitr. We should not bomb during the holy days of Muslims because this would offend them worldwide. How offensive was it for them to pick the high holy day, the day of atonement, for them to bomb Israel? Hannah Nishrawi says that Palestine has always been one of the most open, liberal, pluralistic, and tolerant societies in the region. Well, I don't know what time frame uh, Hannah Nishrawi is talking about, but first of all, there's never been a Palestinian state. There's never been a, a society, a self-governing entity known as Palestine in the history of the world. So you have, first of all have to ask yourself what Palestine is Hannah Nishrawi talking about when she defines it that way. But if you want to use liberal, pluralistic, tolerant, and open societies as the standard for the Middle East, there is only one, and it's the, it's the state of Israel. It is the only uh, democratic uh, country uh, in the region out of uh, there are 23 Arab and Muslim states, all varying forms of totalitarian police states, and Israel is the only little tiny bastion of, uh, of democracy and freedom in the region. Islam has always been the most inclusive religion because it didn't come to deny previous religions. It came to affirm uh, the, oh, okay. the two previous religions. My problem is with those in all religions, whether Islam, Christianity, or Judaism, who give themselves license to interpret in the most rigid, dogmatic manner mm -hmm. holy texts and to use them to punish, to pound, to bash the other, and to negate and to deny the other. Mm -hmm. That is the problem. And you have those elements in all three religions. I believe fundamentalism in Christianity is just as dangerous, if not more so, than it is in Islam, than it is in Judaism. Well, I mean, I think Americans would, would say right there, but wait a minute, fundamentalist Christians have not attacked anyone or, oh, or uh, broken down a World Trade Center sort of thing. Uh, no, well, it finds many different expressions. I mean, fundamental Christians also negate the validity and legitimacy of the other, which is very unchristian. Because Christianity is very tolerant well, and human. Okay, even and when fundamentalists tell me, tell me I have no right to exist as a Palestinian, regardless of my religion, and insist on negating my very rights, which is what's happening now, telling me that I should abandon my land, my history, my culture, my security, my life, for the sake of their interpretation of the Bible. This, to me, is the most dogmatic and rigid and unchristian and inhuman way. What I find fascinating is every time we have a released tape by Osama bin Muhammad bin Laden or by Mullah Omar, the first group to which they speak is not the infidel community. It's not the people of the great shaitan. It is, in fact, speaking to other Muslims when they say, you have been obliged, you have been fard ayn, obliged to holy war. In other words, they don't see themselves as fundamentalists. They are purists. They believe the Quran. They believe the hadith. They believe that once you have been obliged to holy war, you must fight holy war. They are not fundamentalists. Instead, they view these Muslims as bad Muslims. If a, if a state is established, do you suppose Hamas and, and other militant groups will stop the uh, resistance? Uh, no, I think, oh yes, they will, of course. The, the, you see, the difference between Hamas and Islamic Jihad um, as, as Palestinian organizations as opposed to other pan-Islamic organizations is that these are linked to a certain national struggle. Uh -huh. Hamas and Jihad are they're part of a struggle against the occupation. Okay. Now, if you remove the occupation, you disarm and defuse well, wait, they, uh, so, but they if you do not a... have a global message. They are not out there. They've never carried out actions outside Palestine. They've never been out there trying to either proselytize or kill people or impose a pan-Islamic agenda. That's one. Two, I think that we have sufficient democratic forces in Palestine in order to weaken extremism by democratic means. Yes. This is what, how we should deal with it. And the majority of Palestinians are committed to uh, a two-state solution, they're committed to uh, accepting the other, they're, uh, they're committed to this inclusive approach, and they don't want to destroy the state of Israel or replace the state of Israel. Hannah Nishrawi suggests that uh, the Palestinian people uh, support a two-state solution, in other words, uh, the idea of a separate Palestinian state, a separate Israeli state living side by side in peace and harmony. 
I have carefully looked at every public opinion survey done of uh, Arabs in that part of the world, and I see no evidence to, to back that up. I wish it were so. I wish it were so. But the truth of the matter is that uh, uh, from my own personal anecdotal experience, the interviews I've conducted on the ground there, I see no evidence to suggest that. Uh, it's wishful thinking on her part at best. I've been listening to Zola for five or six years, and when my mother called and said, uh, I'm planning a trip to Israel, would you like to go? And I didn't hesitate, I said, absolutely. She says, do you know anywhere or how to get there? I says, absolutely, let me give Zola a call. This is the most special place in the world, and uh, this was the place we wanted to be. We can't imagine that we're here. I mean, it's, you know, we just can't imagine we're here. Well, our tours of the Holy Land continue as usual. Uh, there's some tension over there. It's not as dangerous as staying home, and I've specified that many times. But um, on our last tour, we had this opportunity, if you just tuned in, to go into Ramallah and talk with uh, Dr. Hanan Ashrawi, one of the spokespersons for the Palestinian Authority. You've seen her on the news, I'm sure. And um, we took that footage to Arab Christian experts of our own acquaintance, uh, Dr. Ergen Kainer and uh, Joseph Farah. And uh, they commented on what she said. I, I stepped out of it. I'm the neutral observer. I got the uh, testimony from her and I took it to them is all. And here is how it continued. It's hard to believe in light of, well, perhaps he's overly radical, but a Hamas leader said that this resistance, this uh, uh, more than resistance, the militancy will continue until all of the Jews leave the land of Palestine. And it's not a two-state solution. No, that's not something. No, the majority of the Palestinians accept the two-state solution. Let me present you with a hypothesis. Let's say that a group in Idaho or Iowa or some small state sets up a compound, fences it in, and claims it to be the nation of this compound. To prove their point, they stop paying taxes. They set up their own banks. They set up their own systems. To further prove their point, when the police in that city or nearby that compound come by, they shoot them. They begin to go into the neighboring cities and they bomb people. Some of them even strap bombs to themselves, walk into the stores and to the restaurants and strap bombs to themselves. And they make the point and they say, we will not stop this until you recognize our compound as a separate sovereign nation. What would we do as Americans? What would our country do? But in fact, that is what we are asking Israel to do. We are asking terrorists to set up your own country. We are allowing them to bomb Israel to, to, to absolutely obliterate innocent civilians. And we ask them to think that these are acts of war, not terrorism. And then we are asking Israel to recognize them as a state. In other words, to benefit terrorism. Now, why would we not do that in America? Well, obviously, two reasons come to mind. Number one, that's not the way a sovereign nation operates. But secondly, it rewards terrorism. Would we always suspect that they may do more to get more land? Of course, and so should Israel. This is a time for Christians and evangelicals, for Jews to, to unite together and band together. We cannot reward terrorism, and we cannot reward acts of terrorism any more on our land as we would ask Israel to do on its. I can almost hear Americans saying, but wait, uh, Dr. Israeli, there are people in a hundred places in the world are occupied. They don't actually kill the occupier. No, there's they, no other occupier. Uh, no, no well, other how about, uh, military you occupation. You lived in America. We have Native Americans on reservations. They have, uh, they're natives to the land, that and yet has, they're occupied yes, totally, course. and they don't come out and kill people. They, that situation, yes. That situation was resolved in a way which was entirely unfair to the indigenous uh, uh, Americans, yes. but it hasn't been, it's not in recent history, and it hasn't been viewed as uh, uh, an occupation and a struggle for independence now. The uh, Indian nations are seeking their own, the recognition of their own identity and nationhood within the larger America. No, here we are seeking our freedom because we're under military occupation. One of the terms that defines the debate for Palestinian Arabs 
is this word occupation. And we hear it over and over again. And we've heard Hannah Nishrawi use it again. Let me say that there is only one country occupied in the Middle East, and it's the country of Lebanon, which is occupied by Syria. Uh, there is a form of occupation uh, in, in, in Palestine today, and it's the occupation that Yasser Arafat is employing over the Palestinian people in the West Bank and Gaza and so forth. You know, all of that land was given to the Jews under the original uh, UN mandate. Uh, there is another Palestinian country today known as Jordan. Uh, it's always been predominantly Palestinian population and that, that really uh, occupies most of the territory that was granted to the, uh, to the Arabs under the original UN mandate. So this whole silly notion of occupation has to be turned around and stood on its head. Israel is not the occupier. All right. Now, in all fairness, uh, I interview people of all sides and questions. And if I talk to a, an average uh, member of the Israeli parliament, the Knesset, I think he would probably say, look, we were here a long time ago. Palestinians are various Arabs from various states. We mean them no harm. We've brought the 20th century uh, to them and so forth. But they just won't cooperate and won't live in a democracy and we don't know which way to turn. That, that's not the right view of history. No. Ask, ask the Israelis you talk to, when did they come to Palestine? When? Those who were originally Palestinians are a minority within Israel. Most of them came from yes, Brooklyn, agreed, sure, from Moscow. Sure. From, these are people who came in with their different cultures and languages and so on and religion became transformed into a political instrument in order to take over a land in which there were people who've been living continuously for centuries. We've been here for centuries. We didn't emerge only in response to the creation of the State of Israel. Uh, Ashrawi says that uh, we, meaning the Palestinian people, didn't just come about in response to the creation of the State of Israel, only in response. And I think that's uh, there's some candor there that I'd like to see from more of the Palestinian spokesmen. Indeed, what she's acknowledging is the fact that there's been this tremendous influx of Arab population into the region since the creation of the State of Israel. In fact, as I mentioned earlier, that, that influx began uh, back uh, as early as 1900 when the higher levels of Jewish immigration uh, began. Uh, that is a reality. It's a reality that um, uh, needs to be dealt with. Once again, we see that the folks that we refer to as Palestinians are actually coming from uh, 22 Arab states, uh, coming from non-Arab states throughout the world. Uh, they're Muslims from Pakistan. They're Muslims from uh, Indonesia. They're Muslims from all over the world. And today we call them Palestinians, and we're, tr we're discussing giving them uh, uh, rights to a national homeland. It just doesn't make any sense. Now, Israeli politics is changing too as we speak. Yes. My goodness, this week, uh, not only did Arafat appoint new uh, uh, cabinet members, but, but half the Israeli <laughs> government walked out. The, half, uh, half, yes. Uh, uh, it yeah, means a portion. Not only is there changes in the Palestinian cabinet at this time, but in the Israeli Knesset, there's a sea change. Uh, a whole uh, Labor Party walked out of the government. It's a minority of the government, but still, uh, they left. and. Uh, this leaves a uh, possibility of new elections coming up, quite a shake-up. Brings personalities out of the closet, so to speak. <laughs> Just to ask, uh, of course you have Sharon is in power, wants to remain in power. You have Netanyahu being suggested. Do uh, you have any preference among these gentlemen? <laughs> <laughs> Which is the lesser of two evils. Huh? All right. no, I think they all belong to one camp. Yes. They may have internal domestic differences motivated by their own ambition, you know, who uh -oh. wants to outflank whom from the right. But both belong to the most extreme Zionist tradition, uh -huh. which is based on the negation of the other, which is based on the extension of the mentality of occupation, thinking that you can really defeat a nation bent on getting its independence and freedom and, and dignity on its own land. And they both uh, adopt uh, military means and violence okay. as a means of subduing a nation. To me, there is danger to Israel and to Palestine. 
in having such an extremist government. Because you also forgot one ingredient, you forgot Mofaz, who was one oh, yes. person who, who is known for his ruthlessness and, and the violence. new uh, defense minister. Defense minister. Shaul and Mofaz. Shaul Mofaz. And of course they're courting Lieberman, who just came from uh, the ex-Soviet Union, uh -huh. uh, who, who claims that, you know, God gave him all this land, therefore he has to carry out ethnic cleansing and kick out all the Palestinians uh -huh. and, of course, bomb Egypt and bomb Iran and so on. So you have the most irresponsible, you have a very dangerous combination uh, of extremism. Not, not that the Labour Party made a lot of difference in that uh, But wait a minute, cabinet. Barack uh, was a pr uh, Prime Minister of the Labour Party. And Prime Minister before, every yes. every American would like a clear answer to why yes. when he offered a, a viable Palestinian state that in Washington and Arafat didn't say, well, this is what we want, we'll take it. No, I'm glad you raised this question because there have been so many myths and distortions. And the American viewers have accepted a certain version that has nothing to do with reality. Oh. In Camp David, there was no, uh, as you say, generous offer. There were discussions. There were initial ideas, there was nothing in writing, there were no agreements, there were just ideas that kept changing every day, saying, well, how much land can Barak take away from the 22%, which is the West Bank and Gaza, to maintain more settlements? How much land can he take that would leave the Palestinian state territorially non-contiguent and therefore not viable? Uh, he wanted to annex areas within Jerusalem, around Jerusalem. He fragmented the West Bank in three. He wanted us to relinquish the right of return for all refugees, just like that. And then to say that this is the end of the conflict. We said, okay, these are not issues on which we can come to an agreement. These are ideas that need further development. And of course, they will not form a solution because the essential ingredient of justice is missing. So let's explore them further. Yes. There was no rejection and there was no offer. A fundamental point that Dr. Levitt makes here. Number one, it must be stated there was an offer made. And it must be stated that Arafat did in fact walk away. He would not sign an accord and he would not sign an agreement. He has a vested interest in revolution, but perhaps not as much in peace. He walked away. Ashrawi says that during the Barack administration and during those negotiations, uh, uh, there, there, were no, there was no rejection of a peace plan. In fact, she suggests there was no peace plan at all, that there was nothing really concrete put on the table. So there was nothing to reject in the first place. Now, as I understand that she was not uh, a part of those negotiations. She was not a part of the Palestinian Authority's negotiating team. So her understanding of what was happening would be based on the same kind of facts that are available to all of us, people who read newspapers and, and so forth. And people who do read newspapers and who are informed about those negotiations understand that there were indeed very, very concrete proposals unbelievable concessions that were made by Israelis, by the Israeli leadership. Uh, in fact, the Israeli population was stunned that everything was put on the table, including, you know, Jerusalem was put on the table, the Temple Mount was put on the table. Uh, and uh, that is indeed why Barak was ultimately rejected, because this peace plan failed. And the, the Israeli population looked at that and said, there is no way we could ever make these folks, the Palestinians, happy if they rejected uh, these kinds of concessions. Well, that's the long and short of it. Uh, we gave Dr. Ashrawi an open mic, as they call it in the business. She was allowed to talk at length as she pleased. We didn't time it or uh, say that it was a 15-minute interview or whatever, but just let her go ahead and tell us what she wanted to tell us. We then took the tape to our experts, uh, Dr. Kainer and Joseph Farah, Arab uh, Christians in America, and they comment on what she said. You be the judge, okay? I'm in, I'm in the middle. So I, I just, uh, I got the interview and transferred the tape, and that's all. Um, you know, there will come a time in the future where we won't have to worry about these things, obviously. The kingdom to come, and it will be in the Holy Land. It will be in Jerusalem and also in Ramallah. And uh, there will be peace, as the Lord says in Isaiah eleven sixteen. 16. Uh, there shall be a highway for the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria. 
like as it was to Israel in the day that he came up out of the land of Egypt. Isaiah 19 also describes this highway that runs from Arab nation to Arab nation right through Israel, from Assyria through Israel to Egypt and back, and therefore describing a peace. We crossed a border so very treacherous and dangerous just to make this program. Uh, in that day, we could go across national borders, never mind the border between Jerusalem and Ramallah. And at that time, we have the wonderful verse, Isaiah 12, 2, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid, for the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also is become my salvation. Let me teach you something. In Hebrew, the word salvation is Yeshua. It's Jesus' name. <laughs> it's it's, it's uh, the, the, what he was called in Israel, Yeshua. The verse that says uh, Mary called his name Jesus because he brought his people salvation doesn't make any sense unless you use his real name, Yeshua. Then you would say Mary called his name Yeshua, salvation, because he will bring his people salvation. Now it makes sense. So when it says uh, that Jehovah also is become my salvation, the verse teaches that Jehovah becomes Jesus and comes to the earth and brings Yeshua salvation to us. Uh, until that day comes, however, Paul and Jerusalem are awfully close together. And as you can tell from the uh, testimony, there's still quite a bit of argument uh, going on. When I uh, went to Ramallah, I was struck by the fact that we left our hotel and in 15 or 20 minutes we're at this checkpoint that looked like the Berlin Wall for all that. I mean, soldiers and confusion and, and people running here and there and uh, bombed out uh, car and, and all of the rest of it. And um, I was struck by the fact they're so close together. So when you think of these events in Ramallah, uh, it is right on the border of Jerusalem. That as you do that, Sha'alu Shalom Yerushalayim, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Our offer on this program, Israel's Right to the Land. The brief biblical study that comprises this small book is one of the most compelling commentaries on current events that Zola has ever offered. Scripturally authoritative, Israel's Right to the Land. Our other timely offer on this program, The Complete Idiot's Guide to Middle East Conflict. This 474 page book truly unravels the history, theology, and archeology span of the Middle East. Easy to read and understand. The Middle East Conflict. Our free Levitt letter brings you updates on recent events, in-depth articles, Hebrew lessons, and special offers. Please call 1-800-WONDERS. That's 1-800-966-3377. Or write to Zola, Box 12268, Dallas, Texas 75225. When you're on the internet, visit Zola's website, www.levitt.com. Zola Levitt Presents depends on tax-deductible donations from viewers like you.